Western task. Metto il timer. Perfetto. Ok, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so today's talk has a very long title because I want to present you something uh, scientific but also a novel tool that we developed. And all the work has been done together with Dr. Thomas Bose and Professor James Marshall at the University of Sheffield within the ERC project diet. And the main topic is about psychophysical laws. And psychophysical laws explain the relationship between uh, stimulus intensity and its perception in the human brain. And uh, this type of relationship has been observed for a large variety of stimuli. And the later uh, scientists observed that not only human uh, have uh, responded to this type of psychophysical laws, but has been observed also in mammals, fish, birds, uh, insects, and more recently, scientists noticed that also individual cells like the slime mold uh, might uh, follow, actually follow this type of relationship. So uh, this is particularly interesting because uh, we can observe these psychophysical laws also in absence of a brain, so in uh, various type of organism. And what we do here is to check if another type of organism follow these psychophysical laws. And the organism that I will watch is the superorganism. And for superorganisms, we refer uh, to the colony of insects. So if we think about the insect as the organism, the superorganism is the collection of them, that they work together. And uh, if we watch at the colony as a unique entity and how information spread within the colony, then we can try to start to draw parallels between the superorganism and how information spread in the brain and in the, between neurons. And this parallel has been already observed and described in various work. We are not the first, but we uh, bring ahead this idea and we follow this line of research. And in our case, we investigate the psychophysical laws, as I said. And as reference model, we use the honeybee nest size selection. And this model explains how honeybees select their future nest. This uh, process happens in spring uh, in uh, European bees. And when the colony reproduces, the old queen leaves the nest, go to a temporary place together with some thousands of scout bees. And the uh, bees will need to find quickly the future nest location. And they are exposed to danger, so they need to find quickly a good solution and also a consensus solution. They don't need to split. And how they do that, uh, scout bees will explore the environment and might discover potential nest sites in the environment. And bees that discover uh, a place, a good potential place, will return to the swarm and will actively recruit other scout bees through the woggle dance. Then, uh, when two bees committed to two different nest sites encounter with each other, one deliver stop signal to the other, and the one that receives stop signals will revert to an uncommitted state. Finally, bees will uh, spontaneously abandon commitment for poor quality nest sites. So uh, from field observation, biologists observe that the bees manage to make this collective decision through these four types of individual bee actions. Uh, but how the colony selects the best option? I can explain you this through an example in which we have two nests, the blue and the red, and we label as green the uncommitted bees. And we can write these four actions in a more formal way in a chemical reaction-like form. So if we have uh, an initial state, uncommitted, and a final state that is commitment for the blue, and that happens with a certain rate. And so on happens for the um, red nest, and upon uh, encounter of a blue and a green with a certain rate, the blue will recruit the green, and so on for cross-inhibition and abandonment. And bees, when they 
um, before getting committed, they visit the nest and estimate the quality of the nest that we can label as V1 and V2 for the two nests. And the key idea is that uh, the bees will modulate uh, their action as a function of the qu estimated quality. So they will do more frequent discovery, recruitment, cross inhibition for better nests. And that will steer the system toward the convergence toward the best option. So the idea here is to uh, parameterize, let's say, write all this rate as a function of the quality VI. This is the, the uh, parameterization proposed uh, in which everything is uh, dependent on VI and we introduce uh, two terms, the term K that modulate the frequency of individual action and the term H that modulate the frequency of signaling. So we can study our system in a, this ratio of a signaling over uh, individual behavior with a, con with a single parameter. And so what we do is to analyze this model, this work is a theoretical work, uh, we just analyze the model that comes from field observation to see uh, this agreement with psychophysical laws. And uh, we do the analysis uh, of the model in, a for in the form of the uh, master equation that includes stochastic fluctuations. And here I pose a little bit the presentation because I will show you the tool that we developed that allow us to do this type of analysis. Mm. So, uh, the tool is called MUMOT, Multiscale Modeling Tool, developed uh, in our group. And uh, it is uh, written in Jupyter, that is a Python, uh, not, uh, Python framework. And Jupyter allows you to write notebooks. And uh, they are uh, somehow similar to mathematical notebooks in which there are cells that can be uh, dynamically run and you can interact with the cells, uh, with the, the various cells with the commands and uh, is presented as a website yeah, that you can run in your browser. Yeah, for lack of time, I will not run uh, online the cells, but it's already a pre-run um, notebook uh, that uh, anyway show the main functionalities. So here we just load the library, and here the idea is that we want to write a model that uh, in this form of chemical reaction. And uh, in fact, to make it bigger, James. Huh, I don't know how to make it bigger. Okay. So the tool allows us to write and uh, analyze any type of model that can be written in this form in which there is an initial state, a final state, and a constant uh, a transition rate. And this is particularly useful because usually uh, biologists, field uh, experimentalists, often uh, m build up their model in this form. They see a change of state with a rate, and so they can take the model derived from observation and put inside this tool and make a, a first analysis of it. So here we write the model with the specific syntax, and here we parse it. And here is visualizing which uh, the, we visualize the um, transition in which we label A and B as the two possible nests and U the uncommitted uh, Bs. And uh, then once we parse the model, we can show the ODEs. That is done automatically. We have the ODE system that we can then integrate over time. Here there is a time integration of the ODE, and there are widgets that allow us to modify um, the parameter and have real time the change of the system. So with widget, you can really play with the model and have a feeling of how things change. And uh, then you can also visualize a vector field that show you in a bidimensional space how the trajectory vary by varying the parameter. Again, with widget, you can vary uh, it uh, real time. Then we can visualize also a stream plot with uh, stability point or uh, um, unstable uh, uh, fixed point, the, the hollow in the middle. Or we can also run a bifurcation analysis. Here, for example, we see that by increasing the um, value H that was our signaling, we have a pitchfork 
bifurcation. And then the interesting part for uh, this study is the SSA, that is the stochastic simulation algorithm proposed by Gillespie, that allow us to find the approximation of the master equation. And as you see here is a stochastic uh, run in which you include the fluctuation due to the finite system size. And if we reduce the system size, we have larger fluctuation. And if we increase it, uh, the fluctuation are much smaller, as expected. And then we can use this type of uh, finite system uh, fluctuation to estimate which is the noise around the stable point here for the system size 70. And then finally, you can also visualize a multi-agent uh, simulation result in which agents are the dots that communicate uh, on a fixed topology that is indicated by lines connecting uh, the agents. And this is a fixed topology uh, simulation, but we can also have a time-varying uh, topology in which uh, particles move in the space and only interact locally with the neighbors. So this is just a quick overview. You have, if you have more questions, uh, you can find me later and ask more. So going back to the uh, main presentation, we use this tool to um, approximate the solution of the master equation through the stochastic simulation algorithm. And we did so for studying the, if uh, our uh, superorganism respond to psychophysical laws, as uh, is in agreement with them. So we systematically vary the decision condition, quality and number of nest, potential nest size, to study how they relate to the ability to discriminate, so to select the best quality and location, and we, how much time they take to make the decision. And we do that to study uh, these three laws, the Weber, the Pierron, and the ick Eymann's law. I want to mention that uh, as been already observed in, in Something happened. Yeah, try to do problems connect. Ah. Okay, we are back. So yeah, I was just mentioning. I was spoiling, that's why it went away. It was a spoiler, that, uh, because probably next presentation will tell us that uh, has been already observed uh, that uh, insects might follow psychophysical law, but the study investigated at the, le uh, make the study at the level of the single individual. Instead here, we w don't watch single individual response, but uh, we study the things at the level of the superorganism. So now I will go through these three laws. I explain you what they are and we, if we find an agreement. Let's start from the Weber's law. Uh, Weber's law uh, describes uh, the relationship between the stimulus intensity and its discriminability. So I explain you what it is through an example on numerosity. So now you have to tell me which is the larger set that you observe. So I will present you two sets. You need to uh, reply. So this is set one, and this is the second set. So please rise, raise your hand if you believe this is the larger set. And now raise your hand if you believe this is the larger set. OK, everybody got it right. This is the larger set. Now again, a second uh, experiment uh, in which you have again to find the larger set. And these are the two sets. So please raise your hand if you believe this is the larger set. And now please raise your hand if you believe this is the larger set. OK, still uh, you, you did pretty well, but there were uh, many more uh, errors. Uh, why there were many more errors and you couldn't, not everybody could reliably distinguish the same difference? Because the difference was still 5, but 5 is enough to correctly discriminate between 25 and 30, but uh, it's not enough to correctly discriminate when we have larger set. This is explained by the Weber's law that say that the minimum difference between two stimuli uh, that an organism can correctly discriminate is a constant fraction of the base stimulus strength. So we can write formally like this, or if we have 
on the horizontal axis the stimulus strength, so the number of dots, uh, the just notable difference increase linearly. That is what we expect to see. And uh, in our system, we varied uh, the option quality, so the quality of the nest location presented to the swarm, and we monitor the decision outcome when they reliably, so the 75% of the time, select the best one. And what we find is indeed a linear relationship and also what we notice is that uh, the uh, accuracy, the ability to discriminate between uh, two sources improve and becomes more precise but with, an in with the increase of the swarm size. This is due to the random fluctuation that we saw before we were playing with the tool in which uh, smaller swarm have larger fluctuation and leads to larger number of errors. Then we uh, move to uh, analyze the Pierron's law, which uh, studied the relationship between the stimulus intensity and the reaction time. And again, I will explain what it is through an example, this time on brightness. So you have to uh, see when the circle appears and will appear here at the fixation cross. And then, it appeared, and then a second circle will appear uh, again uh, below. And what has been observed is that you are slower to react to this circle and quicker to this one. So the brighter, the quicker. This is explained by the Pierron's law that says that the mean reaction time decreases as a power law with increased stimulant strength. And we can be formally written like this. Oh, and uh, if we have on the horizontal axis the stimulus strength, what we expect is a power law decrease. And in our case, what we did, we vary the option quality and we monitor the, re the time to, to make the decision. So this is the data from the experiment, uh, the simulation data, and they nicely fit with the power law. Then finally, we uh, moved to investigate the E. Kaiman's law, in which we studied the relationship between the amount of information and the reaction time. And I explain again quickly through an example on uh, what is on brightness, what is the X Simon law, so which is the brightest circle you have to locate between three options that will appear here. And the second example is instead on six options, again to find the brightest circle. And the idea here is that you are quicker when there are three options and slower when there are six. And this can be uh, described by the fact that uh, the reaction time increases with the amount of information to be processed and can be formally written in this way where S is the time to process one bit and I is a function of the number of alternatives. And the function can have various forms and uh, uh, that depends on the type of task. And in literature we found that uh, theoretical study on neurological model observed uh, that for this type of task, value sensitive decision in best of n case, there is a non-linear increase. So that is what we expect to find. So what we did is to increase the number of possible nests and to measure the uh, time to reach a quorum. This is the data that we obtain that they fit with an exponential curve. This might be scary because you say the system doesn't scale well, although uh, we also notice that the swarm can counteract this fact by increasing signaling. So by speaking more, transferring more information, there is a power law decrease. So somehow the swarm might balance this exponential increase by increasing the communication. So um, with this I conclude. I just want to mention uh, as first thing that this is a theoretical study. We didn't work with real bees, but comes from uh, uh, a model that is derived from field observation. And what uh, we observe is that the emergent behavior of the superorganism may obey to three through these three laws. I put in red and bold the word emergent because what we see is an emergent property because none of the single individual follow anything that is linked to these psychophysical laws. 
But what we observe is that the group, uh, the, the, the superorganisms, display this relationship. So we are in front of a form of swarm cognition. And this is part of a larger project, as I mentioned, the lead by James Marshall, the diode project, in which we try to find uh, links between various uh, systems and find the common motives uh, that explain the system. This is a step forward in this direction and uh, in which we link the uh, functioning of the brain to the superorganism that is composed instead of neurons by insects. With this, I conclude. Thanks for your attention.